What is the inverse function? Well, if a function f assigns elements x to elements y, then the inverse function goes the other way around and assigns y elements to x elements. Let's see an example. Imagine that we have the following function that I'm going to define by the following diagram, the function f, which assigns alpha, beta, gamma, and delta to the numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4. How does this assignment is realized? Well, for example, alpha can, can be assigned to 2 under f, beta to 3, gamma to 4, and delta to 1. So this is the diagrammatic point of view on a function. From the relation point of view, let's, uh, let us define big F to be the following set of order pairs. So the first one is alpha 2, and then beta 3, and so on. Beta 3, gamma 4, and delta 1. Okay? So we have uh, the same function, two points of view, and I want the inverse function. Well, the inverse function must assign now elements, the y elements, to the x elements. And for that, let's just flip the arrows. So, we, this one is assigned now to this one. This one now is assigned to this one. The 3 is assigned to beta, and 4 is assigned to delta. And now, let's define these new arrows in green as a function g. Similarly, we can define the, s the relation point of view for G, which is the following list of order pairs. We just flip the entries. So you get 2 alpha, and then 3 beta, 4 gamma, and finally 1 delta. And again, we have a new function, what we wa which we call the inverse function of F, and from the two points of view. Now, looking more closely at this thing, notice that we can make the composition of, this of these two functions. Let's do it because it go is going to reveal us something very important about these two things. So, for example, if I have g of f of, for example, it could be alpha. Recall that this, by definition, is g of f of alpha. Okay? So this is thing, this step here is by definition of compositional function that we saw previously. Now, but what is f of alpha? Well, f of alpha is 2. So this is the same thing as g of 2. We use here at this step the fact that we know explicitly the function f. And finally, g of 2. What is g of 2? Well, g of 2, we follow the arrow. So it's alpha again. Okay? So the input to the composite function is alpha, and the output is again alpha. Let's see another, another composition. So this is g of f. Let's make f of g. And let's give f of g, let's give it 4. What is 4? Well, by definition, again, we have f g of 4. So far, so good. Now, g of 4, let's look at, at the diagram of g, and we follow the, exactly the green arrow, and to 4, we assign gamma. So, f, f of gamma. But what is, what is f of gamma? Well, if we again, follow the arrows, because we know the two functions explicitly, and we get, you get here, the 4 again. Okay? So, this is gamma, and the black arrow is assigned to 4. So, you see, again, the input 4 to the composite, and you get 4 again. Now, you can already see that this is, a, this is a general trend on the entire thing. So, in general, we write that, that f of g uh, of y is equal to y for all y in big Y, and big Y is this thing here, okay? So this thing is true for every single y that you choose. In particular, it was true for 4 here. And for this thing, f of uh, f g of f of any value x, well, it returns x again. 
So alpha was returned again as alpha under this action. So this thing is true for all x belonging to the set big X. And big X is this thing here. Okay? This is a very important idea. Because we already have seen in the previous lecture a function that does just this. Remember, it was the identity function, right? The identity function here. You see, let me write e of y. When it, when it acted on y, it returns y. And recall that e of x of x is equal to x for every y or x. So by comparing these two things, you must conclude that this thing here must be this thing, okay? So in general, let me write here that f of g, in this particular case, must be the same thing as the identity function, not on x, but on y, here, must be careful, on y, and g of f must be the identity on x. Is it okay? Now, let's make three important observations regarding these functions, okay? The fir first, let's see. The first observation is as follows. So first observation. If you start with a function and that, uh, if that function has an inverse, that inverse is unique. So unique. And because uh, that inverse is unique, we should give it a special symbol. We gave that special. You gave it. The, we gave so far the symbol G for the inverse of f. But now let's make this. Give it a new name. Instead of G, let's call it f minus one. So f minus one is a new symbol that I invented that tells us that is a function or the procedure that is the inverse f, of just f, okay? It's a better letter than g, okay? Because it tells you exactly what it's supposed to mean. Unlike g, we have to remember, okay? So this is a general thing. The second observation was is as follows. We have our functions gave explicitly. We, gave the, we have the diagram in front of us, the f diagram, and we also add the the or or the the list of ordered pairs, and if you have those things explicitly, th then it's easy to find the inverse. You just flip either the arrows or the entries, okay? So, f given given by graph graph uh, or should I say diagram? It's probably more clear to make to say diagram diagram or a list of ordered pairs makes easy to find f minus one or big F minus one. Big F minus one is, th is this thing here. So this thing is big F minus one, the inverse under this point of view, the relation point of view, okay? So, so far, so good. Let's mo make more, more observations regarding this thing. The third one, the third observation, is that F or big F are bijective. This is very important. Are bijective because, you see, the function is one-to-one -one and it's onto, okay? So every, in other words, one-to-one -one means every one element on the domain corresponds to unique element in the uh, in the range, and secondly, the codomain is the same as the range, meaning the entire el uh, all the elements in the y set, on the big y set here, well, are have some corresponding x. Okay, so uh, if uh, f uh, when f or, or f or big f are bijective, well. Then we have an inverse. Then 
we have an inverse. Okay, you will see later when it's not bijective. W first, why does it not have an inverse, and what should we do about it? Okay, but for now it's just a fact of life. You need an in a bijective function to have an inverse function.